Hey everyone, welcome to week two and this video lecture overview of week two as we discuss applied logistic regression in our SPSS and SPSS model, modeler application for marketing 6344. The agenda is to review the modeler tool and its interface. Uh, we did cover some of this in week one, but we just want to have a quick review to make sure we're all comfortable with some of the basic function of the system, uh, working with nodes, running a stream or a part of a stream, opening and saving a stream. And also we're going to spend uh, tonight on a type of analysis called logistic regression through the IBM SPSS and modeler system. The goal is to learn how to use the basics of IBM SPSS modeler. Uh, like I said, working with nodes, running a stream, etc. Uh, we'll learn on the basic framework of a data mining project and how to build and deploy a model. A model. We'll understand the basics of logistic regression and be able to apply to a business problem. And how logistic regression really is a useful analysis type for various business problems. And how to interpret the results of a logistic regression exercise and make marketing recommendations based on the results. Because remember, it's always important to understand how to make marketing insights or recommendations or decisions with the analysis that you're conducting. Let's take a look at some of these key areas again um, that you guys, you all did look at in week one. This is an example stream, okay? What we wanted to just walk through again, though, is a step-by-step -step process of a stream. First, your database or your import of data. You all did work on an Excel document of sample data last week. You know that your sources can be multiple things, such as a database. Let's say you're pulling in from SQL, SQL. You're pulling in from Tableau. You're pulling in from any data source that you have. Then your stream works into this area of prepared data. Okay. So for this example, it's a database of data on something around data that has information on men, an age group, a category, and then an output of statistics around a certain men age group for some type of analysis. So an example stream, very straightforward from beginning to end, and just a visual to show what an example stream looks like in Modeler. For the user interface, we dig over this in week one, but just to kind of reiterate the important areas, your main menu at the top, where you want to insert your data, you want to save your, your stream, your extensions, your super nodes, which we'll do more of later in the course. This is your toolbar of all your applications below that. Again, a save icon, explore more details. All of this you'll get more familiar with throughout the term, but this is your toolbar. I explained it last week that they consider this a a kind of a an example of what a painter would do. So your stream canvas, it's your overall white space here is your canvas that you can build out your models and your streams in. This is your palette, if you will, of options of things you can go from from sources to record ops, field ops, graphs, just the different options you have, if you will, of what to build out in your stream. And then under each palette, like output, for example, these are each nodes. So everything from table, matrix, analysis, all the way through are nodes per each of the palette options. And really these are just your puzzle pieces to put together to build out your stream on the stream canvas. The palettes again, so sources, importing data, very important to understand what data you're pulling in. The great thing about Modeler, it does allow multiple types of data files or connections to other databases, so that's very robust. So the preparation of your data is in these ops here. Okay, it's one of your operational methods of data analytics. What you're really trying to do is just what are you trying to, to bring in? What kind of data view are you trying to build? How do you connect certain types of views of the data from your sources? Then the output, right? After you build the model or you build the um, the connection between the source of data and the data set, 
to now over here, the output, the visualization piece, your graph, your histogram, bar graph, pie charts, you name it, your modeling, so how you want to model certain types of analytics, your output, of course, the final results, the visualization piece, and your export for reporting. So very straightforward, left to right, order of operations, and the key palette functions that you'll need to get familiar with throughout the class as you work on your assignments and just get familiar with the tool. So your stream, you manage the pane tabs in the top, streams, outputs, models. You know, your streams, again, you're going to have, this is the top right of your modeler uh, view. You can have multiple streams, right? So you're working on basically multiple uh, analysis, and you can save them and refer back to them, which is very important, especially if something you're analyzing on a regular basis or want to refer back to based on a specific campaign. But regardless, though, this is your stream set. Okay, this is basically going to bring you back to that canvas view and give you an overall view in your modeler kind of palette canvas area of what you built. And you can go back and modify it, say you want an analysis and you want to go back to a stream. Having a record of that stream is great. So you can maybe modify it, uh, you know, try different attributes, try different analysis models and see if uh, what works for you there. Your output view, again, is just going to be the output of those streams. So you get to the result, and then the models again, so you can model the actual analysis you want started. Think of it basically as an archive of all of your analytics in the tool. You have your project pane tabs. So, you know, we looked at the CRISP DM method last week. Classes, this is just where you're going to archive overall projects. So you can have multiple streams in a project. Uh, you can have just one stream. It just depends on what you're doing. But again, this is going to be your step-by-step method we talked about last week of Chris and where to find it in the system. So creating a stream, general rules, okay? So we start with step one of the table, your data, right? First off, actually really your database first, then your table is the first place to check. Always bring in a table node after your first step here of bringing in the data source, whether that is SQL, the database, or an Excel document, Whichever source of data you have, always build in a table node to connect to because you want to audit, make sure that the data that you captured is accurate, that the, the database or the uh, overall data source node that's pulling in the data is accurate. You're going to compare and contrast the table inside modeler to the source. And just like last week's example that I walked through, you're going to build out, well, what are you trying to um, Look at, you know, for example, if we had data around men and women, I want to build a node or record ops of each of them and I build out the, the framework of what I want to look at. So I care, let's say I bring this in, I want to analyze the age and age categories of men. So here age is, you know, different age groups, age category, maybe I categorize them, you know, younger, older audience or certain age ranges. And then you have your actual kind of modeling here. So if you want to do a statistical model, what type is that? What is that going to be built out? Your, your, then you maybe you want to do just the visualization of the data, step two, your histogram age. So maybe we're going to show histogram bar graph of different age groups, right? And then down here, same thing pretty much. Uh, we just didn't go through all the steps over here, but a data audit is your probably third step. Your data audit will give you a, a really good view of any discrepancies or uh, errors, if you will, because the data audit is going to truly read off everything before it, okay, uh, all steps before to make sure it all synced up. It gives you a really good set of, you know, uh, a, a feel good, if you will, that you ran a sanity check that you ran your analytics correctly. So this is a general flow of what a stream would look like. So, yes, using the mouse, basically, you know, how do you get to where you need to go, right? Uh, the left mouse button is your main source. Of course, you can select, place, and move your objects. You know, your objects are all the things I talked about, your nodes, you know, your connecting places, your connecting from one node to the next. Um, you're going to right-click, though, to invoke a context menu. It's just basically like any platform where you need the additional elements of opt-ins, you right-click, and then use your middle mouse to modify connections if you need to. Pretty straightforward stuff, but again, 
you're really going to create the connection of notes here. If you need to do additional kind of context menu, you need to, you know, replace the term, you need to connect something differently, you'll use that. And it's pretty straightforward once you use the tool more and more. One key element to understand is the ability to take fields and data points and ensure that you're able to create some nodes in an output object. So for example, let's say I wanted to just join two attributes together and do something like the node and or or, where you would right click inside the node of the output. And I wanted to know men, male who are married, and married or married, right? So sometimes you can do an and or type analysis. I wanna know who are men and those who are married or men and those who are married, right? So that way in the analysis of let's say a survey or data set of, a, of an analysis, I'm looking at you know the audience of married men. So it's a very straightforward function, but very important to understand because at times we do wanna look at the difference between two sets of variables and characteristics of our customers, right? So and or function for the most part is a derived node in an output format. One of the final views you'll get overall in executing a stream is, is such as this, as we looked at earlier. The we'll walk through the steps about how to take each piece of the process, you know, starting out with the database overview here on the left. This is a SQL SQL database where we're pulling in some raw data or a data set. Again, it could be Excel, a CSV file, Tableau, another data source that you have injected into the tool. Go above that, make sure you do your audit of a table. The table is just going to give you a grid format to review the data. Just match that up to the original data source just to make sure, again, that all your data is being captured in the system. That's a good way to do that kind of check and balance. Then you build out your overall operation. So again, what selection of data are you going to do? What attributes for, for this for example, it's men and women. You could have other things. Let's say you're a retailer looking at categories. You want to look how clothing is selling versus electronics. You can look at different types of products, stuff like that. Then you get into the attributes of those uh, classes, if you will, or groups or categories. Then you drill down further, and then on the far right, you build out your model, statistics model, uh, whatever statistics model you're looking to inject. And then you can also visualize the data to make sure you have a good visualization technique as well. And over at the very bottom, you can run a data audit on the entire stream to make sure that there is a checks and balances again on your output of information. What is great about Modeler, these checks and balances go a long way to make sure you have a confidence level and a confidence that the data was built correctly. So in summary, we looked at the overall user interface of IBM SPSS Modeler, looked at how we can work with our nodes and how to connect them together and build out a framework for analysis, the steps and orders of running a stream or part of a stream, Opening and saving is pretty straightforward. File, open, saving screen. But then remember the view we had earlier, the top right, you have all your archive and collection of streams you've ran. So basically a place to refer back to, to either rerun them or modify them for the future. And then use the online help. There's a lot of great information out there um, in your in your guide book, if you will. There's also some resources through IBM, links in that guide book and also on the IBM SPSS Modeler website in case you ever need further support. So that's the unit two summary there, and I appreciate your time on that piece. Let's move on to logistic regression. Let's now take a look at applying logistic regression and talk about the use of logistic regression in analyzing marketing dynamics, consumer behavior and the ability that logistic regression gives us some type of probability or predictive indicator of what could occur based off the data we have at a given point. We're going to also talk about the work being done this week on the Book Finders Book Club assignment and how to work through that at a high level. 
We're also going to talk about logistic regression versus the RFM model and the benefits of logistic regression versus the RFM model. So LR, logistic regression versus RFM, and if you remember, RFM stands for recency, frequency, and monetary. So when you're analyzing, let's say, consumer behavior in e-commerce, for example, for the recency, frequency, and monetary RFM model, that's very important to understand the behavioral traits and patterns, if you will, of your customers. When we're looking at how often they purchase with us, how often they visit our website or even our store, if you're in an in-person environment, how much money are they spending, right, per customer? These are ways to analyze the, the lifetime value of our customers, the frequency on how often they come to our website or brand so we can figure out a good frequency model of advertising, perhaps. And then recency, right? We're trying to drive retention methods. So how do we ensure that with the amount of times they're visiting us, how often we get repeat customers, and how often they're spending, we can develop some type of digital marketing strategy around that. So it uses data that even the most basic of customer level databases will contain. The RFM model has this basic idea, as I discussed, of dividing customers into groups or sales or segments based on the recency, frequency, and monetary value of their purchasers. You can truly use this model as a model to get an ability to segment based off your most loyal customers, the most active, versus those who are not coming to your website or business as often three to build their repeat business, right? So you've acquired them, but now I need to retain them. And then monetary value, how can I increase their spending and purchases and cross market to increase their spend? And that's how we gain more profitability. It's very broad though. It's a very broadly applicable uh, model, which does work, but it has some limitations, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now this is the RFM model. Very simple, intuitive, very straightforward analytics. Um, it's, it has a very easy way to understand how to analyze the basics of customer behavior. But logistic regression gives you more of a finite potential outcome based off predictive indicators. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Again, RSM is useful and it does give you some straightforward analytics, but it's not very quote unquote sophisticated. It doesn't really go deeper into the other characteristics or potential behavior patterns that are influencing your customers. Clearly, other variables are also important. Just because they visit so many times to your store or website, or they purchase, you know, a set amount of dollars for every transaction, there are influence indicators because of that, right? So think from a consumer behavior perspective, things that influence us to make purchases such as our values and beliefs, such as the promotional value, the pricing, you know, anything that we do in strategies to influence our customers, those variables are important. So if you want a much broader view, an ability to understand it in more detail, this is where we'll get into logistic regression. The question you ask is how much better would a more complex custom design model be? So you can get in deeper to understand more about the behavioral traits, patterns, and characteristics of your customers. What you're looking at here is, you know, the RFM model, but really how you look at it from an application perspective when you really group, you know, your CRM strategies, right? This is a typical CRM application of binary or categorical dependent variables. What it means is you have a very set amount of variables that you're using to really build digital marketing and digital experiences towards your customer. So the first in the, in, the, in the overall process is acquisition, right? So we're gonna identify our prospects, our target market. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that from a perspective of, you know, who is our target audience for all the reasons you do that, based off attributes, based off what your product or service offers to a certain audience. Then you go and activate the actual marketing to acquire them. We know when we're actually marketing to our customers, not every customer is going to react. But we do get some responses, right? We do get some, you know, um, 
activation, if you will, of those customers, where a set of those customers that we market to are going to respond, whether that's clicking through an advertisement, signing up for our, our, our business, actually buying from us, whatever action we're trying to get them to achieve. And from that point, yes, we build out a relationship from the customer. Once we've acquired them, our job is now to retain them, right? This is where the RFM model really comes into play. You look at who's new, how, and then who's returning, right? Because sometimes our advertising is speaking to both a new target audience versus existing audience that we want to bring back for recency or retention. So within that, though, you do all the different types of analysis of who's our return customer versus new, what are they spending, what are they not spending, right? High value customers versus low value. All of our customers are valuable in the essence we all want to treat them equitably in the essence we care about their relationship. But we know that from a, from a marketing perspective, we should probably try and market to those who spend with us often as high value customers, the ones that we know are more likely they are going to purchase from us. There's a different marketing campaign there we can develop versus the lower level uh, value customers who don't buy from us often. They have a low frequency, they have a low recency, and they don't spend a lot with us. So you maybe market to them less often, but at times to still drive a value with them. But it's the overall relationship management here, looking at different models of who are our customers, right? We want to get in deeper than just who's new versus existing. What is the makeup of our customer base, right? What are those segments? Where are they from? What are their, you know, demographics, income levels? All of these characteristics are built in here. Then after that, though, we want to try to minimize the churn, right? The churn that there's voluntary, we really want to reduce absolutely in a CRM application and in a overall RFM uh, analysis and even in logistic regression. Our whole goal is to acquire customers, retain them, and lessen the amount of those who leave, right? eventually unsubscribe from our marketing campaign, who, you know, close their account, who don't stop with us, period. That churn is going to happen, but we want to do is minimize that. And we can look at that from a predictive aspect and look at patterns. Let's say your high-value customers, a, a segment of that high-value customer starts buying less. We see that there was a time period where there was a customer set that was high frequency, high recency, and high spend high monetary value, but then over time, they, they slow down. The amount of transactions slow down, the amount of visits to a website, et cetera. So you have predictive indicators on that to look for, for to find out how I can do something to entice them to come back. So this is an overall model set of CRM, but where your analytics of RFM really take place. And in a moment, we'll again discuss logistic regression where you can still work within the CRM model and do more deeper analytics to truly build out acquisition, retention, and the reduce of churn. So logistic regression, let's start very straightforward. You know, what is it? Logistic regression is truly a probability type analysis, right? Probability on what could occur. And then in a predictive analytics perspective, the more than likely outcome is going to occur, right? In this, it's really, this or that, you know, zero or one. So one thing you have to understand when you code variables like yes and no, male and female, green versus blue, just two variables, two attributes, <clears throat> in logistic regression, you're always going to start with zero and one. The reason why, especially in this tool of IBM, whether SPSS and modeler, and then in deeper analytics later, you'll also understand that the zero always stands for a, the first variable and one stands for the second. Sometimes it seems counterintuitive. You probably would want to do one and two. But in this aspect, the zero or one are the, the variables that you're going to code. So zero would equal yes, one would equal no, or zero would equal male, one would equal female. It's just how the systems and the analytics are read, right? A numeric value equals this this uh, character value. Okay, that's really all it is. It's just mapping data to be read into the analysis. But the essence of it, though, it's this or that type of analytics. So how do we use it in marketing, right? The application of logistic regression, yes and no, are one and zero in marketing. Pretty straightforward. Credit card approval and storing. So when we want to, if we're a credit card company or a bank and we want to offer a pre-offered 
credit card. Well, do these do these customers have this set of customers have a score of let's say 650 or more? Yes or no? Anybody above yes, we're going to give them a pre-approval to a credit card, right? Very straightforward. You build your criteria, and it could be a simple above or below, right? One or, or zero or one above or below is zero or one, and that's another example of that. Predicting purchases, you know, yes or no. We can look at a, a historical trend of customers buying, for example, uh, fitness equipment and fitness products, right? We can take, uh, and then we have a history of those who have bought it and those who have it. So if we want to do a targeted marketing campaign, which customers have bought from us in the in the past, and predictably, because of the amount of times they purchased with us, will they potentially purchase from us again in these fitness products? So if I'm building a marketing campaign on these fitness products, and I want to really be focused on a segment, I simply go who's bought from us in the past and more likely to buy again based off a certain level of purchasing. Let's call it, you know, 10, 10 purchases in a year. Yes or no below that. So if they bought 10 or more purchases, that customer group is more than likely going to purchase from us again. But the yes, target that group. That's my segment versus no, those who bought less than 10 fitness purchases our fitness item is no, and I'm not going to target that customer audience. That's one example. And then, like I said earlier, predicting churn and retention. You can look at that again from a purchase volume. You can look at that again from a visit volume. Let's say just website traffic, right? If we see a decline in traffic, yes or no, how many customers or site visitors uh, below a thousand visits in a year? Let's say that's uh, going to be the ones that are going to have a churn. Those that have more than a thousand visits in a year are less likely to leave. They're going to retain them, right? So we have this benchmark again. It's kind of where does that range look like? And you have to look at that from a historical perspective, descriptive analytics perspective, build that in, and then, and then evaluate yes versus no. So these are straightforward examples, though, of where logistic regression comes in a little bit deeper than just saying, well, because it came, you know, a thousand times in a year to our website, they're going to come, they're going to be a churn potential or not, right? It's actually going a little bit further and letting the predictive modeling of logistic regression it's going to give you that output for you. It gives you a confidence level, if you will, as well. It takes some assumption out of the way a little bit and allows the logistic regression and modeler to kind of give you that predictive outcome. More insights on what is logistic regression. It's also known as logit. So you may hear, you know, someone say it's a logit regression analysis or logistic. For the sake of it, I'll more than likely be calling it logistics. But it, again, is about using it for a binary dependent variable comparison, right? Yes versus no, good credit versus bad credit, buyer, not buyer, you know, customer, potential customer. Um, they left versus stayed or they were retained versus um, new customer. Uh, valid transaction or fraud, it's this or that. It's like regular regression that I can include numeric and categorical variables, interactions, and nonlinear terms. But see, with this, you can extend it further. And it can be extended to dependent variables, which assumes greater than two values. For example, brand choices, brand choice models, green, gold, platinum. But it can get quite complicated. Where, where What this means is, is that there is an ability to say, all right, this customer group left or stayed, but within that though, why? Was it a, uh, a customer group that left because they didn't find good discounts or values or a customer group who stayed because they did like our, our values of our promotions, right? That's an extended variable to give you a better finite outcome based off other characteristics that lead to these this or that type variables. So linear regression, not logistic, but linear regression is a very straightforward statistical analysis model that we're all taught at some point in an analytic curriculum. So in this curriculum, but in general, linear models, right, are this more flow here, okay? In a linear model, you do have a set of, resp of uh, results that lay between zero and one, right? So like logistic, regression, 
which we're really teaching in this lecture, but comparing it to linear regression, it's that it's truly that linear, right? The reality is we do have a set of results, let's say a set of customers, if you will, that we're analyzing that fall out of the zero and one because of outlier type of attributes. You know, there's there's always going to be a set of potential uh, respondents to a survey or a set of sales analytics on customer base or something in our analytics that's going to have outliers. And that's the reality of linear regression. This also happens a lot of the time because we're just analyzing really two attributes, right? Where we're looking at it, it's this or that. So the difference is in the logistic regression is we ideally want to get everything into zero and one, right? We want more of a finite uh, predictability of those who really are going to be this or that. I keep using that terminology, but the two variables, zero or one. Because in linear regression, you're really looking only looking at those potential two things, right? But perhaps there's a variable, a, a secondary variable that really influences the reality of that. And we're going to look at this in a moment to talk about the probability of owning a home as a function of income, right? So from a linear model perspective, think about this. We will believe that, yes, they're likely in the, in the one or zero, they're likely to buy a house. Let's say in a certain geography, you know, real estate agents trying to find out who is the target audience that I need to go after based on income level of where I live. So let's say someone is in the DFW area, and let's say, for example, the DFW area average home price right now is $500,000. I'm making this up, but based on how things are going here in 2022 and I live in the area, that's kind of what I would think maybe an average house price is. So what we're saying is, based on what we know about our customers on their income levels, right, the only attribute we have is that income level and perhaps their, uh, their, their, their let's say, uh, current occupation. Two variables, occupation and income level. But income level is a variable we're going to identify as yes or no. Well, in this analysis, let's say anybody who makes over $100,000 a year, yes or no, right? Well, we want to get anybody with a yes to really stack up in this range, okay? What this means is that it's as simple as that. If they make $100,000 or more, they fit into this range already, right? That's our criteria that we're building. We believe that in a linear regression, our linear, um, yeah, linear regression model, then it's simple as that, that 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 only attribute of income is what matters to buy a home, right? And that's not really the case. The reality is it's deeper than that, right? There are other variables such as location, right? Uh, you know, proximity to a shopping center. There are other reasons why we buy a home. Now, one criteria could be income level. Absolutely. Maybe it makes sense to only target those audiences or as a customer, you know, there's a certain income level we feel comfortable with on the type of home we're looking for that we can afford, but it's not as simple as that. There are other considerations when buying a home. So this is the reality of linear regression if all we're looking at is one variable, income level, right? It gets some people outside of the scope because even though they make maybe $100,000 or more a year, they're not always going to say yes to automatically be interested in a certain home. Or they fall out of that bracket, but they may have other means of that of income that we aren't, you know, even documented. Sometimes income is off maybe someone's day job or salary, but they have other income that isn't being reported in this analysis. So that gives that makes them fall out of that bracket. So it gives us a good targeted audience, but it can limit us on other variables that we can look at, go deeper to find out what audience really is the right audience to go after. So you want an ideal set where you can take other variables, compare them, such as a logistic regression, and get more of an accurate finding on who fits the criteria to buy a home. So when we look at this example of purchasing a home, it's you know, what about a nonlinear model? Getting to that more of a probability of understanding our customers or our potential house owners on what are the characteristics that matter in a home purchase decision. We have this thing called probability owning a home. 
here, right? We want to get to more of a narrow curve of those that have a probability. Again, income is one area, but we can look at other things that matter, right, in owning a home. So there's also this beyond the probably owning a home based on income level. Just because they have the income level doesn't mean there are other financial characteristics to understand about our customer. There are people with high income who have also bad credit, okay? There's also those who have other probabilities of maybe defaulting on a loan. So you have this here, right? A separate analysis beyond just who could own a home based on income level. Well, the same income level, right, left on the X axis. Imagine this is, you know, $10,000 increment. Well, we're still going, you know, left to right on our income range. These don't change, but the probabilities change based off what we're analyzing. So there could be a, a comparison to look at probability default on loan because there's other behavioral characteristics of some customers based off bad credit or a history of foreclosure or a history of something, right? So that's why we need to look deeper than just one variable. So the effectiveness of an increase, say $10,000 to income on the profitability of owning a home or defaulting a loan depends on the starting point. That is, an increase from $40,000 to $50,000 will not have the same effect as an increase from $1 million to $110,000, or to, excuse me, $1 million to, to $1 million $10,000, right? It's also about the higher the income, the more probability as well at times, but also the comparison to other things of the homeowner. So again, just looking at it from a numerical perspective and algorithm perspective, you have your B plus B1. These are your two variables, zero or one, right? Yes or no. Uh, income level, $100,000 above or below as the example, okay? Your linear model, again, is going to have that straight linear line. We're going to have some, you know, segments or responses or some data points results in the middle, but you're going to have outliers, right? Where that the logistic regression model is going to have more of a probability statement, okay? Taking the zero and one, and then you're going to divide that by this algorithm here to get a probability output that's a little bit more precise, okay? You want to see more of this S curve kind of take place, where all the parameters stay within the X and Y axes of the, of the variables you're analyzing, but you get a more of a likelihood of those who are going to be in this subset the responsiveness of certain customers, the output of results for a certain data attribute, whatever that is. And you kind of see here, now you have a range that's more in the S curve versus the curve that's more of a linear progression, if you will, or linear regression, if you will, based off very basic this or that probability. This probability takes in those other variables that you want to analyze, gives you a much more precise view of who is or what type of data results are in the results here. One thing you'll see is something called B0 coefficient that shifts the curve. So let's just think about it simply as this. At a point in time, there are these data points that influence, you know, someone's behavior to buy a house, okay? Well, if we look at it from a broad perspective, your curve can still be very good by looking at income level and type of occupation as an example. If you want to use those two variables, right? Well, let's say the economy is real good and a certain region of, let's say Dallas-Fort Worth is, you know, it's, it's selling well, it's a great market for buyers, right? And you have a wide spectrum of the shift in, the, hey, the market's open, pretty much anybody with a higher income level and or a certain type of occupation for this, you know, type of housing that we have to offer. It's a, it's a broader shift in the curve, meaning that there's a wider open net of potential customers, right? Because it's a hot market. It doesn't necessarily matter as much about their credit score as much. It does, but it doesn't matter as much. You know, it's more of an open kind of S curve here, right? It's a shift out. It's a coefficient because things happen organically in the market from a macroeconomic, macro factor to micro factor in a certain industry, right? Uh, let's say that the raw materials were becoming more available to build homes and, you know, homes were able to be built faster than Let's say the average home takes nine months to build, but there's some reason 
there's a uh, uh, a neighborhood being built that they can get the home done in six months, and that's attractive to certain buyers. That's a shift in the curve now. It opens up more of a market, right? There's these factors that exist that can change the market dynamic and broaden the S curve a little bit, right? Uh, some of those outliers that we had before now being a part of this result set. So that's from a perspective of broader, more more uh, uh, deeper potential customers or audience if in that in this example. So as we said in the previous slide, there could be variables or factors that come up over time that can kind of widen or you know put a broader scope of potential results in the S curve of the coefficients in a logistic regression. And this one, this is where the B1 coefficient controls the steepness, the more of a narrow factor, right? So let's say, for example, in the home purchasing environment, there are very specific factors that focus very certain potential homeowners' decisions of who's going to buy or not. Potentially, one example is having a community that's uh, pet friendly or the ability to have uh, access to a community pool or very specific needs around an HOA or not, right? Homeowners Association. Very narrow, specific requirements and, uh, you know, requests of homeowners. That can narrow that curve a little bit. So the example of income still be on the X axis, right? The income is still important, but we get more uh, micro in our segment when it comes to certain needs of certain customers, right? So this is where the coefficients, when you add in more of those variables or more of those considerations, deepen that curve. So you see the the overall, you know, delineation that we're going to have a more of a, uh, a micro segment, if you will, more of a predictability and more of a predictive outcome on who's going to buy based off other characteristics. Probability is the likelihood of an event and is bounded between zero and one. It's either this or that or somewhere in between, right? So logistic regression is this or that, you know, but there could be somewhere in between, right? A yes or no statement is that. It's the probability of saying yes or no, but it's sometimes analytics, it could also mean possibly, right? I mean, there's this thing in marketing where you have customers that are very finite. Yes, they're going to react to this marketing campaign. No, they're not or somewhere in between because we have this influence factor, right? The probability of yes or no, and then going deeper and finding out, is there a potential to influence? But probability, again, is just this or that between zero and one. Odds is the ratio of two probabilities of the probability of being redeemed to the probability of not being redeemed, right? So what is the odds of this? So think about gambling, pretty straightforward. It's always a probability game of gambling. The odds of winning something. Well, in this and in, in, in an analysis and marketing, it's the it's the odds of these customers responding to this marketing campaign based off this segment of of data points, or the possibility, the probability, excuse me, and the odds of that happening based off predictive outcomes. An odds ratio is the ratio of the two odds. There's a three to one chance, a four to one chance, of somebody reacting to a marketing campaign based off predictive outcomes. Now, very straightforward. So let's take a look at how you read the output of results in the IBM tool modeler and SPSS and how to read some of the probability statements that occur. So we'll use the example of the book finders assignment you're working on this week on the probability and predictability of who's going to buy the book Art of History of Florence. Art history of Florence. Okay. Now, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that a lot of these outputs are going to be robust outputs that you're not necessarily going to have to um, analyze the algorithms or, or conduct the algorithms, if you will. It's going to give you that for you once you select the type of output you're looking for. Okay. What you need to understand is what to read and what they at a high level mean directionally, right? Some of these outputs are just going to give you some guidance and directional thoughts. On the analytics, right? It just supports your mindset around what does the results mean. Okay. So, for example, the very top step one, what you really want to look for here is your significance value. Okay. Top right, uh, sig dot 
you know, remember the p value of 0.05 if it's 0.05 or below you have a high significance value meaning that you can trust that the predictability has a pretty good outcome to occur right whereas if it's higher than that 0.05 then that and we also call it p value then it's not a variable or a an output of coefficients you need to worry about okay so you look at that then below that under model summary just remember r square is a as a a method of find out another indicator whether or not your predictability of your results is going to be uh accurate or close to accuracy right because again nothing's 100 percent, but you get as close to accuracy as possible with a predictable model so here r square point 117.258 the higher the better there's not an exact number that always equates to exact predictability but the higher, the more than likely it's going to occur in this subset. These numbers are relatively high, to, you know, in the hypothesis of who's going to buy this book or not. What you really want to look at, though, from a linear, excuse me, a logistic regression analysis perspective is the classification table at the bottom. Okay, so the intake here was, are they going to buy the art of history, art history of in Florence book or not? Okay. So it was observed in the analysis that no, they're going to buy it, or yes, they bought it, right? This was based off an analysis of the various attributes and data points and variables of the customer set, right? So over here, read the results. They correctly identified that 45,126 have not bought the book, Art History of Florence. Okay, so they had a 99% accuracy on saying that 45,000 or 99% accuracy on those who said no. Okay, there were 352 respondents that did buy the book, although the predictive outcome model here in this analysis observed and thought no. So there was a small subset, 0.8%, less than 1%. That this analysis got incorrect, but if you think about it, 99% is still a very, very strong indicator that this analysis worked well on the model saying no, they did not buy the art history of Florence. Okay. So they did a great job in this analysis analyzing those who did not buy the book. Whereas here, yes, okay, was not as much. They had out of those who said yes, that the, the algorithm thought bought the book, well, 3,838 did actually not buy it. The algorithm, the analysis said yes, but in truth, it was no, right? So that means it was only a 50% accuracy because 684, they got correct as in buying it, yes. So the predictability here is that this model is much better at predicting no than yes. Let's take a look now at the coefficients table, right, in logistic regression. So this is called variables in the equation. These are all the different variables that exist and what we analyze to find out whether or not we can predictively look at who has the likelihood of buying the art history of Florence book and what variables matter about our customers, okay? So if we take a look at the B, column on the left and the far right b column on the right okay these are called your betas or these are called overall your coefficient indicators on what variables matter or not so if you look at the first set of b columns and you see there there's there's those customers who have children who have bought youth books before cookbooks do-it-yourself books reference books art history geography et cetera et cetera the number of total dollars they spent in their genders right if it's a negative number, like for example, child at negative 0.186, whether or not someone has a child is not a positive, is a negative and not a positive indicator that's going to influence this analysis or not, okay? Meaning that having a child or not does not really sway the output of likelihood of someone buying a book called Art History of Florence, okay? So what this means is that the variables such as buying a reference book at 0.235, 
showing an interest in art books at 1.156, geography at 0.574. We can take those variables with positive coefficients and say those are the indicators or the variables that are more likely going to indicate the likelihood of someone purchasing that book, okay? That's what that means. The higher the B coefficient, the more likelihood that indicator, that variable is going to indicate this uh, result set of who's going to buy the book or not, okay? It doesn't mean you can't still put in the variables of child, youth, cook, do-it-yourself books, et cetera, but it's not going to give you as a precise of a predicted outcome as the other variables that are positive in the B coefficient, okay? The other thing you want to look at, too, is the significance value in the second to last column. They're all 0. .000, which means they all have some significance, though, as an indicator to predictability of buying this book or not. But it does revalidate that not that all of these variables are important into consideration, okay? So you can still use all of them in your analysis if you desire to. Um, it does show there's, there's validity. They're, they're all valid. But... It also means cross-reference which variables from a B coefficient perspective really tr truly provide the better indicators, such as, again, the reference books, art, and geography. So this is how you read the tables. It's how you interpret the data, basically, and make some assumptions based on which variables are more important to the predictive analytics versus the others. So to sum up how we interpret this type of data, the odds ratio is a multiplicative coefficient. Positive effects are greater than one. Negative effects are between zero and one. Okay. Magnitudes of positive and negative coefficients may be compared by taking the inverse of a negative effect or vice versa. For example, a positive odds ratio of two has the same magnitude as a negative factor of 0.5. We just need to look at this coefficient perspective, like I just talked about before and truly understand what a negative impact versus positive impact means as a variable to the predictability of the outcome, right? The probability of something occurring or not. Okay, at this point, what we're going to do is show a demo in Modeler of how to run the actual assignment for the week and step-by-step -step how to run this logistic regression. So what I'm going to ask you to do is actually pause the video here, go watch the BB demo inside the assignment for the week, and I'll provide a link to that as well here in this uh, area uh, for you to check out. Go watch that, watch the demo step by step on how to run that assignment, and come back to this video to finish the lecture. All right, so hope you had a chance to go watch the demo of running the analysis for the bookstore finder uh, assignment on predictability around the art history of Florence and how to run that in Modeler. You know, once you've conducted those steps, you actually get some outputs of information. Here's some of the uh, various ways to look at the case summary. As you can see, the end tiles of predicted probability, right, one through 10, you have various summations of, you know, the end, the total number of respondents, say 50,000, so you have the average scores, right, the average means, if you will, off that, okay? So while there was a 10% split, all 10 of these groups, very straightforward, right? You have 10%, 10%, 10%, 5,000 approximately each, right, that were assessed. You know, the number uh, averages are different, right? So those in these groups here of a 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3 have a higher set uh, percent than those who don't. Very straightforward for summation. But it's important to understand that, right? Because the predicted probability is trying to give us those percentages of those groups who are more likely to buy this book. And if you remember earlier, a few minutes ago, we talked about the variables that exist, right? And we talked about those who have bought certain books, such as art or reference or geography books. More than likely, they probably fit into these percentages here than others. So it's one way to read this case summary perspective. Other case summaries, right, a little bit more in depth, okay? We can look at the purchase probability decile of the 10 different groups here, right? How much they spent, pretty important. 
so especially if something you want to know from a profitability perspective, which we'll come back to in just a moment. But you know, the amount of dollars that your customers spend is pretty important. So this is kind of where you tie in linear regression with that RFM that we talked about at the very beginning. Or excuse me, where you relate logistic regression to the RFM method, right? Recency, frequency, and monetary. Well, here's your monetary values. Here's your frequency values, right? The month since they last purchased. So you have those who've spent more and who have spent more recent, okay? Versus those who have spent a relatively decent amount of money, total spent, but haven't bought in a long time. So you can kind of still bring in the RFM uh, method, if you will, into your thought process. You can still look at this and say, month since the last purchase, well, these are the customers who don't buy as often from us. You know, it's been 17, 25 months here at the bottom and just aisles nine and 10 at the very bottom here and the month since last purchase column. And you can still make an assumption that those customers aren't either, you know, as loyal, as interested, or don't read as much. Maybe they aren't, aren't, they still like the type of book, but they don't read as often, right? It's not much as much of a uh, activity for them as others. Then you go across all these different fields at the top here, number of purchases in children's books, youth books, cookbooks, do it yourself, all the way to the right down to art and geography and it's another way of just looking at what we talked about earlier again if you can look at you know again the very top decile that's your probability set right number one so look at the purchase probability decile group one they've spent the most money at 257 dollars they buy more frequently or more or more recent if you will at seven months since the last purchase they on the far right as we said indicators of those who buy reference art and geography books are more likely to buy. So that all correlates right back to the other data points we looked at earlier and the ways to view the data. So this is a good way to segment though your groups further, right? To understand on average, how much do they spend in the top group? We know they buy a lot of art and geography books. So they also spend on average $257, right? So we can look at how much that group is worth in the lifetime value or uh, monetary value as well. And you can take multiple groups and segment to them and really build out the framework on how to influence those who already are more loyal, are more likely to buy, and versus those who are not. We can still try to influence those customers who may want to buy the, the book, Art History of, of Florence, in the middle group, only because we have some data that says they're relatively interested in art books and geography and reference, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't mean that they're not going to buy it. It just means that there's an indicator that says, they may be a little bit more challenging to market to, but we can try something to influence them. Your list table, again, a lot of these are just different ways to interpret the data and interpret the results, okay? So again, we have 50,000 total customers and 10 different deciles, column groups, all equally split in 5,000, right? 5,000 groups. So then you have the number of buyers in those groups and the response rate. Right, response rate is very important. You want to understand the percentage of those who are going to respond to a marketing campaign. Right, we are always measuring effectiveness of marketing when it comes to the responsiveness, the cumulative number of buyers from that response rate, and the list we got from them. Right, a list truly is a list on, uh, you know, whether that's a purchase in this aspect, it could be another type of campaign where we just care about a list and driving subscriptions, signing up for something. Whatever that action is, right? A lift is a almost conversion type action, right? We want to see a lift from certain customers. So we got a, a bigger lift from those in that first, second, third docile group, or excuse me, decile group, because again, the previous data showed a correlation between those attributes of them and why they are more likely to purchase this book. But we can also go back now and say we also have a higher lift at these numbers because of those top deciles knowing of the groups who buy reference books, art, uh, art books, geography, and those other characteristics of how often they buy from us and how much, well, you would think obviously correlates into a higher lift from them as well and higher response rate. It all correlates, but it's also in their data view to find out how else are they impacting your results. Here's just a way to, to, to uh, visualize it, your, cumul your cumulative lift graph, right? The cumulative percent of customers, the number of customers, generally, yes, it goes down 
the less customers you have, right? The top 20% is 450 customers count down to your top, you know, bottom 100 customers at the very bottom. So, yes, obviously, the higher the lift, the more number of customers, but you can actually now look at the potential numeric value in this curve type of graph. A game table. Again, these are all just different ways to read the results. Again, same breakdown of 5,000 per customer group, percent, percentage of customers, right? Each have about 10%. As you stack, as you stack up though, the more you get down to the bottom of 100%, number of vial, but the gains is again where you're going to get back the gains from this audience, right? The percent gains perhaps in sales or gains in the overall, uh, metric that you're evaluating. But in this aspect, we're getting a much higher predictability, much higher gain from our customers that are in the top, you know, one, two, or three deciles here, right? That's an important thing to consider as well, especially if you're on a limited budget, right? Limited, limited advertising budget. And someone says, well, I need you to analyze those potential customers. And, and the gains is where we're going to say, yes, based on predictability, these are those groups. And these are the ones that are more than likely the better um, groups to, you know, target based on the gains and percentage of outcome we're going to get from them based off their spending habits, based off their habits of what they bought before. These are the groups we want to target for a marketing campaign. Something else we can do with this model is actually go deeper than just marketing analytics to identify the groups or individuals that are more than likely going to buy this art of Florence book, we can look at profitability as well. We can generate an analysis off, let's say, a campaign that we sent out, a mailer, if you will, and look at certain types of metrics here. Now, it's pretty straightforward on analyzing, you know, how to how to get to the calculation of gross profit and gross sales. But this is how you read it from a case summary perspective. So if you're zero and one, right, your groups that you did or did not send it to, right, the one is yes, and those are actually we sent it out to 15,000 customers, 3,321 actually made a purchase, okay? This 3,327 is your yes group to send it to, these are the amount of people we sent it to, and those who actually, let's say, made a transaction, right? This is the group that we do not want to send it to. This is the group right here that out of that 50,000 is yes, we're sending the uh, advertisement to 15,611 is who we, you know, say, sent an email blast to 300. 3,327 in a summation, some column bought it. So your gross profit is the 3,327 purchasers. Okay. Let's say they bought at $6 a book. Okay. Subtracting though that it costs 50 cents total for each of the different 15,611 to send them to. Right. So yes, $19,962 was made in the profitability sales. So 3,327 individuals bought the book at $6 profit. Okay. See the cost of goods being $6 per book. That's $19,962. But then you have to take away the cost of advertising. So let's say it costs 50 cents, which is still kind of high to be honest, but just for simple math, it costs 50 cents for each one of the 15,611 uh, customers we sent it to. So you have to take that advertising spend away from the gross profit dollars. So 19,962 minus the cost of the advertise of 7,850 and 50 cents. Their gross profit still pretty good at $12,156 and 50 cents. So while I spent uh, $7,805, I still sold uh, in profit $12,000 of profit. I look at gross sales. So let's say, you know, the book was $18, you know, the actual cost to the customer, that the customer purchased each book was $18. So we knew that 3,327 bought the book at $18, right? Very straightforward gross sales, top line sales, if you want to call it that, of 59,886. So that's gross sales, gross revenue at the top line, right? So remember profitability, we said earlier, what was the gross profit percent? What's that $12,000, 156, as we did a gross profit analysis above based off the cost of goods sold minus the advertising budget, okay? You take that percent of 12156 
and $50 and divide that by the gross sales of 59,886 to get 0.203, which is 20.3%. So a very simple way to calculate your gross profit is 20%. So basically what this means is, is that we, so far in this analysis of profitability, our advertising method of sending, sending this out based on our predictive model that 15,611 potential customers are worth marketing to so they've shown attributes and variables that yes so a likely outcome they may purchase with us and when we send out an email blast as an example to those 15,611 3,327 actually bought you work your math and that means that we made a 20 percent gross profit off those 3,327 customers but then it's the return on your marketing expenditures okay so you need to look at the return on investment as well right so if I made $12,156.50 in gross profit dollars, but I divide that by my actual um, advertising spend, right? My my email blast marketing cost $7,850.50. I actually got a 155.74% return on marketing expenditure, which isn't bad, right? I almost doubled my gross profit based on the on the number that I, I I've actually over and doubled the um, amount that I spent in return on my investment. So that's very good. This is an example where if you get very finite knowing your right audience in analytics on the logistic regression, and then in return, do something with that on a marketing recommendation to market to a certain sector of customers, and then analyze the profitability in these formulas, you can see the kind of fruits of your labor, if you will. You see the benefit of what you're doing from these results. All right, to sum everything up, your assignment, again, as you walk through the um, actual demo and through some of these steps here of the output is answer the questions, what factors predict whether a customer will purchase the book, Art History of Florence? You can take some of the insights that I even spoke to in this lecture and from the demo uh, walkthrough to answer those questions. You just want to replicate those results in Modeler, okay? Uh, you want to screenshot the actual results you got looking similar to what we provided in the lecture. Interpret the results, provide your own assumptions based on what we talked about. What are the right customer groups to market this book to and why? And then challenge, can you build a better model and how would you measure, right? It's not asking you to necessarily go build it, but just kind of, you know, what is another way you would want to analyze this data set? How else would you look at the data that you've got at your disposal to analyze who is the best potential customer? So I appreciate your time in this overview. I wish you well on the assignment. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for your time.